Chapter One of More Selected Classics of Washington Irving. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Greg Giordano. More Selected Classics of Washington Irving by washington irving chapter one the wife the treasures of the deep are not so precious as are the concealed comforts of a man locked up in woman's love i scent the air of blessings when i come but near the house what a delicious breath marriage sends forth the violet beds no sweeter middleton I have often had occasion to remark the fortitude with which women sustain the most overwhelming reverses of fortune, those disasters which break down the spirit of a man, and prostrate him in the dust, seem to call forth all the energies of the softer sex, and give such intrepidity and elevation to their character, that at times it approaches to sublimity. Nothing can be more touching than to behold a soft and tender female, who had been all weakness and dependence, and alive to every trivial roughness, while threading the prosperous paths of life, suddenly rising in mental force, to be the comforter and support of her husband under misfortune, and abiding with unshrinking firmness the bitterest blasts of adversity. As the vine which has long twined its graceful foliage about the oak, and been lifted by it into sunshine, will, when the hardy plant is rifted by the thunderbolt, cling round it with its caressing tendrils, and bind up its shattering boughs. So it is beautifully ordered by providence that woman, who is the mere dependent and ornament of man in his happier hours, should be his stay and solace when smitten with sudden calamity winding herself into the rugged recesses of his nature, tenderly supporting the drooping head, and binding up the broken heart. I was once congratulating a friend, who had around him a blooming family, knit together in the strongest affection. Quote, I can wish you no better lot, said he, with enthusiasm, than to have a wife and children. If you are prosperous, there they are to share your prosperity if otherwise there they are to comfort you End quote. and indeed i have observed that a married man falling into misfortune is more apt to retrieve his situation in the world than a single one partly because he is more stimulated to exertion by the necessities of the helpless and beloved beings who depend upon him for subsistence but chiefly because his spirits are soothed and relieved by domestic endearments and his self-respect kept alive by finding that though all abroad is darkness and humiliation yet there is still a little world of love at home of which he is the monarch whereas a single man is apt to run to waste and self-neglect to fancy himself lonely and abandoned and his heart to fall to ruin like some deserted mansion for want of an inhabitant these observations call to mind a little domestic story of which I was once a witness. My intimate friend, Leslie, had married a beautiful and accomplished girl who had been brought up in the midst of fashionable life. She had, it is true, no fortune, but that of my friend was ample, and he delighted in the anticipation of indulging her in every elegant pursuit and administering to those delicate tastes and fancies that spread a kind of witchery about the sex. Quote, Her life, said he, shall be like a fairy tale. End quote. The very difference in their characters produced a harmonious combination. He was of a romantic and somewhat serious cast. She was all life and gladness. I have often noticed the mute rapture with which he would gaze upon her in company, of which her sprightly powers made her the delight, and how, in the midst of applause her eye would still turn to him as if there alone 
she sought favor and acceptance when leaning on his arm her slender form contrasted finely with his tall manly person the fond confiding air with which she looked up to him seemed to call forth a flush of triumphant pride and cherishing tenderness as if he doted on his lovely burden from its very helplessness never did a couple set forward on the flowery path of early and well-suited marriage with a fairer prospect of felicity it was the misfortune of my friend however to have embarked his property in large speculations and he had not been married many months when by a succession of sudden disasters it was swept from him and he found himself reduced to almost penury for a time he kept his situation to himself and went about with a haggard countenance and a breaking heart his life was but a protracted agony and what rendered it more insupportable was the necessity of keeping up a smile in the presence of his wife for he could not bring himself to overwhelm her with the news she saw however with the quick eyes of affection that all was not well with him she marked his altered looks and stifled sighs and was not to be deceived by his sickly and vapid attempts at cheerfulness she tasked all her sprightly powers and tender blandishments to win him back to happiness but she only drove the arrow deeper into his soul the more he saw cause to love her the more torturing was the thought that he was soon to make her wretched a little while thought he and the smile will vanish from that cheek the song will die away from those lips the lustre of those eyes will be quenched with sorrow and the happy heart which now beats lightly in that bosom will be weighed down like mine by the cares and miseries of the world at length he came to me one day and related his whole situation in a tone of the deepest despair when i had heard him though i inquired does your wife know all this at the question he burst into an agony of tears for god's sake cried he if you have any pity on me don't mention my wife it is the thought of her that drives me almost to madness and why not said i she must know it sooner or later you cannot keep it long from her and the intelligence may break upon her in a more startling manner than if imparted by yourself for the accents of those we love soften the hardest tidings soften the harshest tidings besides you are depriving yourself of the comforts of her sympathy and not merely that but also endangering the only bond that can keep hearts together an unreserved community of thought and feeling she will soon perceive that something is secretly preying upon your mind and true love will not brook reserve it feels undervalued and outraged when even the sorrows of those it loves are concealed from it oh but my friend to think what a blow i am to give to all her future prospects how am i to strike her very soul to the earth by telling her that her husband is a beggar that she is to forego all the elegancies of life all the pleasures of society to shrink with me into indigence and obscurity to tell her that i have dragged her down from the sphere in which she might have continued to move in constant brightness the light of every eye the admiration of every heart how can she bear poverty she has been brought up at all the refinements of opulence how can she bear neglect she has been the idol of society oh it will break her heart it will break her heart i saw his grief was eloquent and i let it have its flow for sorrow relieves itself by words when his paroxysm had subsided and he had relapsed into moody silence i resumed the subject gently and urged him to break his situation at once to his wife he shook his head mournfully but positively but how are you to keep it from her is it necessary she should know it that you may take the steps proper to the alteration of your circumstances you must change your style of living nay observing a pang to pass across his countenance don't let that afflict you i am sure you have never placed your happiness in outward show you have yet friends warm friends 
who will not think the worse of you for being less splendidly lodged and surely it does not require a palace to be happy with mary i could be happy with her cried he convulsively in a hovel i could go down with her into poverty in the dust i could i could god bless her god bless her cried he bursting into a transport of grief and tenderness and believe me my friend said i stepping up and grasping him warmly by the hand believe me she can be the same with you ay more it will be a source of pride and triumph to her it will call forth all the latent energies and fervent sympathies of her nature for she will rejoice to prove that she loves you for yourself there is in every true woman's heart a spark of heavenly fire which lies dormant in the broad daylight of prosperity but which kindles up and beams and blazes in the dark hour of adversity no man knows what the wife of his bosom is no man knows what a ministering angel she is until he has gone with her through the fiery trials of the world there was something in the earnestness of my manner and the figurative style of my language that caught the excited imagination of leslie i knew the auditor i had to deal with and following up the impression i had made i finished by persuading him to go home and unburden his sad heart to his wife i must confess notwithstanding all i had said i felt some little solicitude for the result who can calculate on the fortitude of one whose life has been a round of pleasures her gay spirits might revolt at the dark downward path of low humility suddenly pointed out before her and might cling to the sunny regions in which they had hitherto revelled in which they had hitherto revelled besides ruin in fashionable life is accompanied by so many galling mortifications to which in other ranks it is a stranger in short i could not meet leslie the next morning without trepidation he had made the disclosure and how did she bear it like an angel it seemed rather to be a relief to her mind for she threw her arms around my neck and asked if this was all that had lately made me unhappy but poor girl added he she cannot realize the change we must undergo she has no idea of poverty but in the abstract she has only read of it in poetry where it is allied to love she feels as yet no privation she suffers no loss of accustomed conveniences nor elegancies when we come practically to experience its sordid cares its paltry wants its petty humiliations then will be the real trial but said i now that you have got over the severest task that of breaking it to her the sooner you let the world into the secret the better the disclosure may be mortifying but then it is a single misery and soon over whereas you otherwise suffer it in anticipation every hour in the day it is not poverty so much as pretense that harasses a ruined man the struggle between a proud mind and an empty purse the keeping up a hollow show that must soon come to an end have the courage to appear poor and you disarm poverty of its sharpest sting on this point i found leslie perfectly prepared he had no false pride himself and as to his wife she was only anxious to conform to their altered fortunes some days afterwards he called upon me in the evening he had disposed of his dwelling-house and taken a small cottage in the country a few miles from town he had been busied all day in sending out furniture the new establishment required a few articles and those of the simplest kind all the splendid furniture of his late residence had been sold excepting his wife's harp that he said was too closely associated with the idea of herself it belonged to the little story of their loves for some of the sweetest moments of their courtship were those when he had leaned over that instrument and listened to the melting tones of her voice i could not but smile at this instance of romantic gallantry in a doting husband 
he was now going out to the cottage where his wife had been all day superintending its arrangement my feelings had become strongly interested in the progress of his family story and as it was a fine evening i offered to accompany him he was wearied with the fatigues of the day and as we walked out fell into a fit of gloomy musing poor mary at length broke with a heavy sigh from his lips and what of her asked i has anything happened to her what said he darting an impatient glance is it nothing to be reduced to this paltry situation to be caged in a miserable cottage to be obliged to toil almost in the menial concerns of her wretched habitation has she then repined at the change repined she has been nothing but sweetness and good humour indeed she seems in better spirits than i have ever known her she has been to me all love and tenderness and comfort admirable girl exclaimed i you call yourself poor my friend you never were so rich you never knew the boundless treasures of excellence you possessed in that woman oh but my friend if this first meeting at the cottage were over i think i could then be comfortable but this is her first day of real experience she has been introduced into a humble dwelling she has been employed all day in arranging its miserable equipments she has for the first time known the fatigues of domestic employment she has for the first time looked around her on a house destitute of everything elegant almost of everything convenient and may now be sitting down exhausted and spiritless brooding over a prospect of future poverty there was a degree of probability in this picture that i could not gainsay so we walked on in silence after turning from the main road up a narrow lane so thickly shaded with forest trees as to give it a complete air of seclusion we came in sight of the cottage it was humble enough in its appearance for the most pastoral poet and yet it had a pleasing rural look a wild vine had overrun one end with a profusion of foliage a few trees threw their branches gracefully over it and i observed several pots of flowers tastefully disposed about the door and on the grass plot in front a small wicket gate opened upon a footpath that wound through some shrubbery to the door just as we approached we heard the sound of music leslie grasped my arm we paused and listened it was mary's voice singing in a style of the most touching simplicity a little air of which her husband was peculiarly fond i felt leslie's hand tremble on my arm he stepped forward to hear more distinctly his step made a noise on the gravel walk a bright beautiful face glanced out the window and vanished a light footstep was heard and mary came tripping forth to meet us she was in a pretty rural dress of white a few wild flowers were twisted in her fine hair a fresh bloom was on her cheek her whole countenance beamed with smiles i had never seen her look so lovely my dear george cried she i am so glad you are come i have been watching and watching for you and running down the lane and looking out for you i have set out a table under a beautiful tree behind the cottage and i have been gathering some of the most delicious strawberries for i know you are fond of them and we have such excellent cream and everything is so sweet and still here oh she said putting her arm within his and looking up brightly in his face oh we shall be so happy poor leslie was overcome he caught her to his bosom he folded his arms around her he kissed her again and again he could not speak but the tears gushed into his eyes and he has often assured me that though the world has since gone prosperously with him and his life has indeed been a happy one yet never has he experienced a moment of more exquisite felicity end of chapter one recording by greg giordano newport ritchie florida chapter two of 
more selected classics of washington irving by washington irving this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by greg giordano chapter two english writers on america methinks i see in my mind a noble and puissant nation rousting herself like a strong man after sleep and shaking her invincible locks methinks i see her as an eagle mewing her mighty youth and kindling her in dazzled eyes at the full midday beam milton on the liberty of the press it is with feelings of deep regret that i observe the literary animosity daily growing up between england and america great curiosity has been awakened of late with respect to the united states and the london press is teemed with volumes of travels through the republic but they seem intended to diffuse error rather than knowledge and so successful have they been that notwithstanding the constant intercourse between the nations there is no people concerning whom the great mass of the british public have less pure information or entertain more numerous prejudices english travellers are the best and the worst in the world where no motives of pride or interest intervene none can equal them for profound and philosophical views of society or faithful and graphical description of external objects but when either the interest or reputation of their own country comes in collision with that of another they go to the opposite extreme and forget their usual probity and candour in the indulgence of splenetic remark and illiberal spirit of ridicule hence their travels are more honest and accurate the more remote the country described i would place implicit confidence in an englishman's description of the regions beyond the cataracts of the nile of unknown islands in the yellow sea of the interior of india or of any other tract which other travellers might be apt to picture out with the illusions of their fancies but i would cautiously receive his account of his immediate neighbours and of those nations with which he is in habits of most frequent intercourse however i might be disposed to trust his probity i dare not trust his prejudices it has also been the peculiar lot of our country to be visited by the worst kind of english travellers while men of philosophical spirit and cultivated minds have been sent from england to ransack the poles to penetrate the deserts and to study the manners and customs of barbarous nations and to study the manners and customs of barbarous nations with which she can have no permanent intercourse of profit or pleasure it has been left to the broken-down tradesman the scheming adventurer the wandering mechanic the manchester and birmingham agent to be her oracles respecting america from such sources she is content to receive her information respecting a country in a singular state of moral and physical development a country in which one of the greatest political experiments in the history of the world is now performing and which presents the most profound and momentous studies to the statesman and the philosopher that such men should give prejudicial accounts of america is not a matter of surprise the themes it offers for contemplation are too vast and elevated for their capacities the national character is yet in a state of fermentation it may have its frothiness and sediment but its ingredients are sound and wholesome it has already given proofs of powerful and generous qualities and the whole promises to settle down into something substantially excellent but the causes which are operating to strengthen and ennoble it and its daily indications of admirable properties are all lost upon these purblind observers who are only affected by the little asperities incident to its present situation they are capable of judging only of the surface of things of those matters which come in contact with their private interests and personal gratifications they miss some of the snug conveniences and petty comforts which belong to an old highly finished and overpopulous state of society where the ranks of useful labor are crowded and many earn a painful and servile subsistence these minor comforts however are all important in the estimation of narrow minds 
which either do not perceive or will not acknowledge that they are more than counterbalanced among us by great and generally diffused blessings they may perhaps have been disappointed in some unreasonable expectation of sudden gain they may have pictured america to themselves in el dorado where gold and silver abounded and the natives were lacking in sagacity and where they were to become strangely and suddenly rich in some unforeseen but easy manner the same weakness of mind that indulges absurd expectations produces petulance and disappointment such persons become embittered against the country on finding that there as everywhere else a man must sow before he can reap must win wealth by industry and talent and must contend with the common difficulties of nature and the shrewdness of an intelligent and enterprising people perhaps through mistaken or ill-directed hospitality or from the prompt disposition to cheer and countenance the stranger prevalent among my countrymen they may have been treated with unwonted respect in america and having been accustomed all their lives to consider themselves below the surface of good society and brought up in a servile feeling of inferiority they become arrogant on the common boon of civility they attribute to the lowliness of others their own elevation and underrate a society where there are no artificial distinctions and where by any chance such individuals as themselves can rise to consequence one would suppose however that information coming from such sources on the subject where the truth is so desirable will be received with caution by the censors of the press that the motives of these men their veracity their opportunities of inquiry and observation and their capacities for judging correctly would be rigorously scrutinized before their evidence was admitted in such sweeping extent against a kindred nation the very reverse however is the case and it furnishes a striking instance of human inconsistency nothing can surpass the vigilance with which english critics will examine the credibility of the traveller who publishes an account of some distant and comparatively unimportant country how warily will they compare the measurements of a pyramid or the description of a ruin and how sternly will they censure any inaccuracy in these contributions of merely curious knowledge while they will receive with eagerness and unhesitating faith the gross misrepresentations of coarse and obscure writers concerning a country with which their own is placed in the most important and delicate relations nay they will even make these apocryphal volumes textbooks on which to enlarge with a zeal and an ability worthy of a more generous cause i shall not however dwell on this irksome and hackneyed topic nor should i have adverted to it but for the undue interest apparently taken in it by my countrymen and certain injurious effects which i apprehend it might produce upon the national feeling we attach too much consequence to these attacks they cannot do us any essential injury the tissue of misrepresentations attempted to be woven round us are like cobwebs woven round the limbs of an infant giant our country continually outgrows them one falsehood after another falls off of itself we have but to live on and every day we live a whole volume of refutation all the writers of england united if we could for a moment suppose their great minds stooping to so unworthy a combination could not conceal our rapidly growing importance in matchless prosperity they could not conceal that these are owing not merely to physical and local but also to moral causes to the political liberty the general diffusion of knowledge the prevalence of sound moral and religious principles which give force and sustain energy to the character of a people and which in fact have been the acknowledged and wonderful supporters of their own national power and glory but why are we so exquisitely alive to the aspersions of england why do we suffer ourselves to be so affected by the contumely she has endeavoured to cast upon us is it not in the opinion of england alone that honour lives and reputation has its being the world at large is the arbiter of a nation's fame with its thousand eyes it witnesses a nation's deeds and from their collective testimony is national glory or national disgrace established for ourselves therefore it is comparatively of but little importance whether england does us justice or not it is perhaps of far more importance to herself 
she is instilling anger and resentment into the bosom of a youthful nation to grow with its growth and strengthen with its strength if in america as some of her writers are laboring to convince her she is hereafter to find an invidious rival and a gigantic foe she may thank those very writers for having provoked rivalship and irritated hostility every one knows the all-pervading influence of literature at the present day and how much the opinions and passions of mankind are under its control the mere contests of the sword are temporary the wounds are but in the flesh and it is the pride of the generous to forgive and forget them but the slanders of the pen pierce to the heart they rankle longest in the noblest spirits they dwell ever present in the mind and render it morbidly sensitive to the most trifling collision it is but seldom that any one over an act produces hostilities between two nations there exists most commonly a previous jealousy and ill-will a predisposition to take offence trace these to their cause and how often will they be found to originate in the mischievous effusions of mercenary writers who secure in their closets and for ignominious bread concoct and circulate the venom that is to inflame the generous and the brave i am not laying too much stress upon this point for it applies most emphatically to our particular case over no nation does the press hold a more absolute control than over the people of america for the universal education of the poorest classes makes every individual a reader there is nothing published in england on the subject of our country that does not circulate through every part of it there is not a calumny dropped from an english pen nor an unworthy sarcasm uttered by an english statesman that does not go to blight good will and add to the mass of latent resentment possessing then as england does the fountainhead whence the literature of the language flows how completely is it in her power and how truly is it her duty to make it the medium of amiable and magnanimous feeling a stream where the two nations might meet together and drink in peace and kindness should she however persist in turning it to waters of bitterness the time may come when she may repent her folly the present friendship of america may be of but little moment to her but the future destinies of that country do not admit of a doubt over those of england there lower some shadows of uncertainty should then a day of gloom arrive should those reverses overtake her from which the proudest empires have not been exempt she may look back with regret at her infatuation in repulsing from her side a nation she might have grappled to her bosom and thus destroying her only chance for real friendship beyond the boundaries of her own dominions there is a general impression in england that the people of the united states are inimical to the parent country it is one of the errors which have been diligently propagated by designing writers there is doubtless considerable political hostility and a general soreness at the illiberality of the english press but collectively speaking the prepossessions of the people are strongly in favor of england indeed at one time they amounted in many parts of the union to an absurd degree of bigotry the bare name of englishmen was a passport to the confidence and hospitality of every family and too often gave a transient currency to the worthless and the ungrateful throughout the country there was something of enthusiasm connected with the idea of england we looked to it with a hallowed feeling of tenderness and veneration as the land of our forefathers the august repository of the monuments and antiquities of our race the birthplace and mausoleum of the sages and heroes of our paternal history after our own country there was none in whose glory we more delighted none whose good opinion we were more anxious to possess none toward which our hearts yearned with such throbbings of warm consanguinity even during the late war whenever there was the least opportunity for kind feelings to spring forth it was the delight of the generous spirits of our country to show that in the midst of hostilities they still kept alive the sparks of future friendship in all this to be at an end in this golden band of kindred sympathies so rare between nations to be broken for ever perhaps it is for the best it may dispel an illusion which might have kept us in mental vassalage which might have interfered occasionally with our true interests and prevented the growth of proper national pride 
but it is hard to give up the kindred tie and there are feelings dearer than interest closer to the heart than pride that will still make us cast back a look of regret as we wander farther and farther from the paternal roof and lament the waywardness of the parent that would repel the affections of the child short-sighted and injudicious however as the conduct of england may be in this system of aspersion recrimination on our part would be equally ill-judged i speak not of a prompt and spirited vindication of our country or the keenest castigation of her slanderers but i allude to a disposition to retaliate in kind to retort sarcasm and inspire prejudice which seems to be spreading widely among our writers let us guard particularly against such a temper for it would double the evil instead of redressing the wrong nothing is so easy and inviting as the retort of abuse and sarcasm but it is a paltry and unprofitable contest it is the alternative of a morbid mind fretted into petulance rather than warmed into indignation if england is willing to permit the mean jealousies of trade or the rancorous animosities of politics to deprave the integrity of her press and poison the fountain of public opinion let us beware of her example she may deem it her interest to diffuse error and engender antipathy for the purpose of checking emigration we have no purpose of the kind to serve neither have we any spirit of national jealousy to gratify for as yet in all our rivalships with england we are the rising and the gaining party there can be no end to answer therefore but the gratification of resentment a mere spirit of retaliation and even that is impotent our retorts are never republished in england they fall short therefore of their aim but they foster a querulous and peevish temper among our writers they sour the sweet flow of our early literature and sow thorns and brambles among its blossoms what is still worse they circulate through our own country and as far as they have effect excite virulent national prejudices this last is the evil most especially to be deprecated governed as we are entirely by public opinion the utmost care should be taken to preserve the purity of the public mind knowledge is power and truth is knowledge whoever therefore knowingly propagates a prejudice willfully saps the foundation of his country's strength the members of a republic above all other men should be candid and dispassionate they are individually portions of the sovereign mind and sovereign will and should be enabled to come to all questions of national concern with calm and unbiased judgments from the peculiar nature of our relations with england we must have more frequent questions of a difficult and delicate character with her than with any other nation questions that affect the most acute and excitable feelings and as in the adjustment of these our national measures must ultimately be determined by popular sentiment we cannot be too anxiously attentive to purify it from all latent passion or prepossession opening too as we do an asylum for strangers every portion of the earth we should receive all with impartiality it should be our pride to exhibit an example of one nation at least destitute of national antipathies and exercising not merely the overt acts of hospitality but those more rare and noble courtesies which spring from liberality of opinion what have we to do with national prejudices they are the inveterate diseases of old countries contracted in rude and ignorant ages when nations knew but little of each other and looked beyond their own boundaries with distrust and hostility we on the contrary have sprung into national existence in an enlightened and philosophic age when the different parts of the habitable world and the various branches of the human family have been indefatigably studied and made known to each other and we forego the advantages of our birth if we do not shake off the national prejudices as we would the local superstitions of the old world but above all let us not be influenced by any angry feelings so far as to shut our eyes to the perception of what is really excellent and amiable in the english character we are a young people necessarily an imitative one and must take our examples and models in a great degree from the existing nations of europe there is no country more worthy of our study than england the spirit of her constitution is most analogous to ours the manners of her people their intellectual activity 
their freedom of opinion, their habits of thinking on those subjects which concern the dearest interests and most sacred charities of private life, are all congenial to the American character, and, in fact, are all intrinsically excellent, for it is the moral feeling of the people that the foundations of British prosperity are laid, and however the superstructure may be time-worn or overrun by abuses, there must be something solid in the basis, admirable in the materials, and stable in the structure of an edifice that so long has towered unshaken amidst the tempests of the world. Let it be the pride of our writers, therefore, discarding all feelings of irritation, and disdaining to retaliate the illiberality of British authors, to speak of the English nation without prejudice, and with determined candor, while they rebuke the indiscriminating bigotry with which some of our countrymen admire and imitate everything English, merely because it is English, let them frankly point out what is really worthy of approbation. We may thus place England before us as a perpetual volume of reference, wherein are recorded sound deductions from ages of experience, and while we avoid the errors and absurdities which may have crept into the page, we may draw thence golden maxims of practical wisdom wherewith to strengthen and to embellish our national character. End of Chapter 2 Recording by Greg Giordano Newport Ritchie, Florida Chapter 3 of More Selected Classics of Washington Irving by Washington Irving This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Greg Giordano The Art of Bookmaking If that severe doom of Senecius be true, quote, it is a greater offence to steal dead men's labour than their clothes. End quote. What shall become of most writers? Burton's Anatomy of Melancholy I have often wondered at the extreme fecundity of the press, and how it comes to pass that so many heads, on which nature seems to have inflicted the curse of barrenness, should teem with voluminous productions. As a man travels on, however, in the journey of life, his objects of wonder daily diminish, and he is continually finding out some very simple cause for some great matter of marvel. Thus have I chanced, in my peregrinations about this great metropolis, to blunder upon a scene which unfolded to me some of the mysteries of the bookmaking craft, and at once put an end to my astonishment. I was one summer's day loitering through the great saloons of the British Museum, with that listlessness with which one is apt to saunter about a museum in warm weather, sometimes lolling over the glass cases of minerals, sometimes studying the hieroglyphics on an Egyptian mummy, and sometimes trying, with nearly equal success, to comprehend the allegorical paintings on the lofty ceilings. Whilst I was gazing about, in this idle way, my attention was attracted to a distant door, at the end of a suite of apartments. It was closed, but every now and then it would open, and some strange favoured being, generally clothed in black, would steal forth, and glide through the rooms, without noticing any of the surrounding objects. There was an air of mystery about this that piqued my languid curiosity, and I determined to attempt the passage of that strait, and to explore the unknown regions beyond. The door yielded to my hand, with all that facility with which the portals of enchanted castles yield to the adventurous knight-errant. I found myself in a spacious chamber, surrounded with great cases of venerable books. Above the cases, and just under the cornice, were arranged a great number of black-looking portraits of ancient authors. About the room were placed long tables, with stands for reading and writing, at which sat many pale, studious personages, poring intently over dusty volumes, rummaging among mouldy manuscripts, and taking copious notes of their contents. A hushed stillness reigned 
through this mysterious apartment excepting that you might hear the racing of pens over sheets of paper and occasionally the deep sigh of one of these sages as he shifted his position to turn over the page of an old folio doubtless arising from that hollowness and flatulency incident to learned research now and then one of these personages would write something on a small slip of paper and ring a bell whereupon a familiar would appear take the paper in profound silence glide out of the room and return shortly loaded with ponderous tomes upon which the other would fall tooth and nail with famished veracity i had no longer a doubt that i had happened upon a body of magi deeply engaged in the study of occult sciences the scene reminded me of an old arabian tale of a philosopher shut up in an enchanted library in the bosom of a mountain which opened only once a year where he made the spirits of the place bring him books of all kinds of dark knowledge so that at the end of the year when the magic portal once more swung open on its hinges he issued forth so versed in forbidden lore as to be able to soar above the heads of the multitude and to control the powers of nature my curiosity being now fully aroused i whispered to one of the familiars as he was about to leave the room and begged an interpretation of the strange scene before me a few words were sufficient for the purpose i found that these mysterious personages whom i had mistaken for magi were principally authors and were in the very act of manufacturing books i was in fact in the reading room of the great british library an immense collection of volumes of all ages and languages many of which are now forgotten and most of which are seldom read one of these sequestered pools of obsolete literature to which modern authors repair and draw buckets full of classic lore or quote, pure english undefiled end quote, wherewith to swell their own scanty rills of thought being now in possession of the secret i sat down in a corner and watched the process of this book manufactory i noticed one lean bilious-looking wit who sought none but the most worm-eaten volumes printed in black letter he was evidently constructing some work of profound erudition that would be purchased by every man who wished to be thought learned placed upon a conspicuous shelf of his library or laid open upon his table but never read i observed him now and then draw a large fragment of biscuit out of his pocket and gnaw whether it was his dinner or whether he was endeavouring to keep off that exhaustion of the stomach produced by much pondering over dry works i leave to harder students than myself to determine there was one dapper little gentleman in bright coloured clothes with a chirping gossiping expression of countenance who had all the appearance of an author on good terms with his bookseller after considering him attentively i recognized in him a diligent getter-up of miscellaneous works which bustled off well with the trade i was curious to see how he manufactured his wares he made more stir and show of business than any of the others dipping into various books fluttering over the leaves of manuscripts taking a morsel out of one a morsel out of another quote, line upon line precept upon precept here a little and there a little end quote. the contents of his book seemed to be as heterogeneous as those of the witch's cauldron in macbeth it was here a finger and there a thumb toe of frog and blind worm sting with his own gossip poured in like baboon's blood to make the medley slab and good after all thought i may not this pilfering disposition be implanted in authors for wise purposes may it not be the way in which providence is taking care that the seeds of knowledge and wisdom shall be preserved from age to age in spite of the inevitable decay of the works in which they were first produced we see that nature has wisely though whimsically provided for the conveyance of seeds from clime to clime in the maws of certain birds so that animals which in themselves are little better than carrion and apparently 
the lawless plunderers of the orchard and the cornfield are in fact nature's carriers to disperse and perpetuate her blessings in like manner the beauties and fine thoughts of ancient and obsolete authors are caught up by these flights of predatory writers and cast forth again to flourish and bear fruit in a remote and distant tract of time many of their works also undergo a kind of metempsychosis and spring up under new forms what was formerly a ponderous history revives in the shape of a romance an old legend changes into a modern play and a sober philosophical treatise furnishes the body for a whole series of bouncing and sparkling essays thus it is in the clearing of our american woodlands where we burn down a forest of stately pines a progeny of dwarf oaks start up in their place and we never see the prostrate trunk of a tree mouldering into soil but it gives birth to a whole tribe of fungi let us not then lament over the decay and oblivion into which ancient writers descend they do but submit to the great law of nature which declares that all sublunary shapes of matter shall be limited in their duration but which decrees also that their element shall never perish generation after generation both in animal and vegetable life passes away but the vital principle is transmitted to posterity and the species continue to flourish thus also do authors beget authors and having produced a numerous progeny in a good old age they sleep with their fathers that is to say with the authors who preceded them and from whom they had stolen whilst i was indulging in these rambling fancies i leaned my head against a pile of reverend folios whether it was owing to the soporific emanations from these works or to the profound quiet of the room or to the lassitude arising from much wandering or to an unlucky habit of napping at improper times and places with which i am grievously afflicted so it was that i fell into a doze still however my imagination continued busy and indeed the same scene continued before my mind's eye only a little changed in some of the details i dreamt that the chamber was still decorated with the portraits of ancient authors but that the number was increased the long tables had disappeared and in place of the sage magi i beheld a ragged threadbare throng such as may be seen playing about the great repository off cast-off clothes monmouth street whenever they seized upon a book by one of those incongruities common to dreams we thought it turned into a garment of foreign or antique fashion with which they proceeded to equip themselves i noticed however that no one pretended to clothe himself from any particular suit but took a sleeve from one a cape from another a skirt from a third thus decking himself out piecemeal while some of his original rags would peep out from among his borrowed finery there was a portly rosy well-fed parson whom i observed ogling several mouldy polemical writers through an eyeglass he soon contrived to slip on the voluminous mantle of one of the old fathers and having purloined the grey beard of another endeavoured to look exceedingly wise but the smirking commonplace of his countenance set at naught all the trappings of wisdom one sickly-looking gentleman was busied embroidering a very flimsy garment with gold thread drawn out of several old court dresses of the reign of queen elizabeth another had trimmed himself magnificently from an illuminated manuscript had stuck a nosegay in his bosom called from quote, the paradise of dainty devices end quote and having put sir philip sidney's hat on one side of his head strutted off with an exquisite air of vulgar elegance a third who was but of puny dimensions had bolstered himself out bravely with the spoils from several obscure tracts of philosophy so that he had a very imposing front but he was lamentably tattered in rear and i perceived that he had patched his small clothes with scraps of parchment from a latin author there were some well-dressed gentlemen it is true who only helped themselves to a gem or so which sparkled among their own ornaments without eclipsing them some too 
seemed to contemplate the costumes of the old writers, merely to imbibe their principles of taste, and to catch their air and spirit. But I grieve to say, that too many were apt to array themselves, from top to toe, in the patchwork manner I have mentioned. I shall not omit to speak of one genius, in drab breeches and gaiters, and an Arcadian hat, who had a violent propensity to the pastoral, but whose rural wanderings had been confined to the classic haunts of Primrose Hill, and the solitudes of the Regent's Park. He had decked himself in wreaths and ribbons from all the old pastoral poets, and, hanging his head on one side, went about with a fantastical, lackadaisical air, quote, babbling about green field, end quote. But the personage that most struck my attention was a pragmatical old gentleman in clerical robes, with a remarkably large and square but bald head. He entered the room wheezing and puffing, elbowed his way through the throng with a look of sturdy self-confidence, and having laid hands upon a thick Greek quarto, clapped it upon his head, and swept majestically away in a formidable frizzled wig. In the height of this literary masquerade, a cry suddenly resounded from every side of, quote, Thieves! Thieves! End quote. I looked, and lo, the portraits about the walls became animated, the old authors thrust out, first a head, then a shoulder, from the canvas, looked down curiously for an instant upon the motley throng, and then descended with fury in their eyes to claim their rifled property. The scene of scampering and hubbub that ensued baffles all description. The unhappy culprits endeavored in vain to escape with their plunder. On one side might be seen half a dozen old monks stripping a modern professor. On another, there was sad devastation carried into the ranks of modern dramatic writers. Beaumont and Fletcher, side by side, raged round the field like Castor and Pollux and sturdy Ben Johnson, and acted more wonders than when a volunteer with the army in Flanders. As to the dapper little compiler of Farragos, mentioned some time since, he had arrayed himself in as many patches and colors as Harlequin, and there was as fierce a contention of claimants about him as about the dead body of Patroclus. I was grieved to see many men, to whom I had been accustomed to look up with awe and reverence, fain to steal off with scarce a rag to cover their nakedness. Just then my eye was caught by the pragmatical old gentleman in the Greek grizzled wig, who was scrambling away in sore affright with half a score of authors in full cry after him. They were close upon his haunches, and a twinkling off went his wig. At every turn some strip of raiment was peeled away, until, in a few moments, from his domineering pomp, he shrunk into a little Percy, quote, chopped bald shot, end quote, and made his exit with only a few tags and rags fluttering at his back. There was something so ludicrous in the catastrophe of this learned Theban that I burst into an immoderate fit of laughter, which broke the whole illusion. The tumult and the scuffle were at an end. The chamber resumed its usual appearance. The old authors shrunk back into their picture frames, and hung in shadowy solemnity along the walls. In short, I found myself wide awake in my corner, with the whole assemblage of hookworms gazing at me with astonishment. Nothing of the dream had been real but my burst of laughter, a sound never before heard in that grave sanctuary, and so abhorrent to the ears of wisdom as to electrify the fraternity. The librarian now stepped up to me, and demanded whether I had a card of admission. At first I did not comprehend him, but I soon found that the library was a kind of literary preserve, subject to game laws, and that no one must presume to hunt there without special license and permission. In a word, I stood convicted of being an errant poacher, and was glad to make a precipitate retreat lest I should have a whole pack of authors let loose upon me. End of chapter 3 Recording by Greg Giordano Newport Ritchie, Florida
Chapter Four of More Selected Classics of Washington Irving by Washington Irving. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Greg Giordano. Chapter Four The Widow and Her Son. Pity old age within whose silver hairs honor and reverence evermore have reigned marlowe's tamburlaine those who are in the habit of remarking such matters must have noticed the passive quiet of an english landscape on sunday the clacking of the mill the regularly recurring stroke of the flail the din of the blacksmith's hammer the whistling of the ploughman the rattling of the cart and all other sounds of rural labor are suspended the very farm dogs bark less frequently being less disturbed by passing travelers at such times i have almost fancied the wind sunk into quiet and that the sunny landscape with its fresh green tints melting into blue haze enjoyed the hallowed calm sweet day so pure so calm so bright the bridal of the earth and sky well was it ordained that the day of devotion should be a day of rest the holy repose which reigns over the face of nature has its moral influence every restless passion is charmed down and we feel the natural religion of the soul gently springing up within us for my part there are feelings that visit me in a country church amid the beautiful serenity of nature which i experience nowhere else and if not a more religious i think i am a better man on sunday than on any other day of the seven during my recent residence in the country i used frequently to attend at the old village church its shadowy aisles its mouldering monuments its dark oaken panelling all reverend with the gloom of departed years seemed to fit it for the haunt of solemn meditation but being in the wealthy aristocratic neighbourhood the glitter of fashion penetrated even into the sanctuary and i felt myself continually thrown back upon the world by the frigidity and pomp of the poor worms around me the only being in the whole congregation who appeared thoroughly to feel the humble and prostrate piety of a true christian was a poor decrepit old woman bending under the weight of years and infirmities she bore the traces of something better than abject poverty the lingerings of decent pride were visible in her appearance her dress though humble in the extreme was scrupulously clean some trivial respect too had been awarded her for she did not take her seat among the village poor but sat alone on the steps of the altar she seemed to have survived all love all friendship all society and to have nothing left her but the hopes of heaven when i saw her feebly rising and bending her aged form in prayer habitually conning her prayer-book which her palsied hand and failing eyes could not permit her to read but which she evidently knew by heart i felt persuaded that the faltering voice of that poor woman arose to heaven far before the responses of the clerk the swell of the organ or the chanting of the choir i am fond of loitering about country churches and this was so delightfully situated that it frequently attracted me it stood on a knoll round which a small stream made a beautiful bend and then wound its way through a long reach of soft meadow scenery the church was surrounded by yew trees which seemed almost coeval with itself its tall gothic spire shot up lightly from among them with rooks and crows generally wheeling about it i was seated there one still sunny morning watching two laborers who were digging a grave they had chosen one of the most remote 
and neglected corners of the churchyard, where, from the number of nameless graves around, it would appear that the indigent and friendless were huddled into the earth. I was told that the new-made grave was for the only son of a poor widow. While I was meditating on the distinctions of worldly rank, which extend thus down into the very dust, the toll of the bell announced the approach of the funeral. They were the obsequies of poverty, with which pride had nothing to do, a coffin of the plainest materials, without pall or other covering, was borne by some of the villagers. The sexton walked before with an air of cold indifference. There were no mock mourners in the trappings of affected woe, but there was one real mourner who feebly tottered after the corpse. It was the aged mother of the deceased, the poor old woman whom I had seen seated on the steps of the altar. She was supported by a humble friend, who was endeavouring to comfort her. A few of the neighbouring poor had joined the train, and some children of the village were running hand in hand, now shouting with unthinking mirth, and now pausing to gaze with childish curiosity on the grief of the mourner. As the funeral train approached the grave, the parson issued from the church porch, arrayed in the surplice, with prayer book in hand, and attended by the clerk. The service, however, was a mere act of charity. The deceased had been destitute, and the survivor was penniless. It was shuffled through, therefore, in form, but coldly and unfeeling. The well-fed priest moved but a few steps from the church door. His voice could scarcely be heard at the grave, and never did I hear the funeral service, that sublime and touching ceremony, turned into such a frigid mummery of words. I approached the grave. The coffin was placed on the ground. On it were inscribed the name and aged of the deceased. George Somers, aged twenty-six years. The poor mother had been assisted to kneel down at the head of it. Her withered hands were clasped, as if in prayer. But I could perceive, by a feeble rocking of the body, and a convulsive motion of the lips, that she was gazing on the last relics of her son with the yearnings of a mother's heart. Preparations were made to deposit the coffin in the earth, there was that bustling stir, which breaks so harshly on the feelings of grief and affection, directions given in the cold tones of business, the striking of spades into sand and gravel, which, at the grave of those we love, is, of all sounds, the most withering. The bustle around seemed to waken the mother from a wretched reverie. She raised her glazed eyes, and looked about with a faint wildness, as the men approached with cords to lower the coffin into the grave. She wrung her hands and broke into an agony of grief. The poor woman who attended her took her by the arm, endeavoring to raise her from the earth, and to whisper something like consolation. Nay now, nay now, don't take it so sorely to heart. She could only shake her head and wring her hands, as one not to be comforted. As they lowered the body into the earth, the creaking of the cord seemed to agonize her. But when, on some accidental obstruction, there was a jostling of the coffin, all the tenderness of the mother burst forth, as if any harm could come to him, who was far beyond the reach of worldly suffering. I could see no more, my heart swelled into my throat, my eyes filled with tears. I felt as if I were acting a barbarous part in standing by, and gazing idly on this scene of maternal anguish. I wandered to another part of the churchyard, where I remained until the funeral train had dispersed. When I saw the mother slowly and painfully quitting the grave, leaving behind her the remains of all that was dear to her on earth, and returning to silence and destitution, my heart ached for her. What, thought I, are the distresses of the rich? They have friends to soothe, pleasures to beguile, 
a world to divert and dissipate their griefs what are the sorrows of the young their growing minds soon close above the wound their elastic spirits soon rise beneath the pressure their green and ductile affections soon twine round new objects but the sorrows of the poor who have no outward appliances to soothe the sorrows of the aged with whom life at best is but a wintry day and who can look for no aftergrowth of joy the sorrows of a widow aged solitary destitute mourning over an only son the last solace of her years these are indeed sorrows which make us feel the impotency of consolation it was some time before i left the churchyard on my way homeward i met with the woman who had acted as comforter she was just returning from accompanying the mother to her lonely habitation and i drew from her some particulars connected with the affecting scene i had witnessed the parents of the deceased had resided in the village from childhood they had inhabited one of the neatest cottages and by various rural occupations and the assistance of a small garden had supported themselves creditably and comfortably and led a happy and a blameless life they had one son who had grown up to be the staff and pride of their age oh sir said the good woman he was such a comely lad so sweet-tempered so kind to every one around him so dutiful to his parents it did one's heart good to see him of a sunday dressed out in his best so tall so straight so cheery supporting his old mother to church for she was always fonder of leaning on george's arm than on her good man's and poor soul she might well be proud of him for a finer lad there was not in the country round unfortunately the son was tempted during a year of scarcity and agricultural hardship to enter into the service of one of the small craft that plied on a neighboring river he had not been long in this employ when he was entrapped by a press gang and carried off to sea his parents received tidings of his seizure but beyond that they could learn nothing it was the loss of their main prop the father who was already infirm grew heartless and melancholy and sunk into his grave the widow left lonely in her age and feebleness could no longer support herself and came upon the parish still there was a kind feeling towards her throughout the village and a certain respect as being one of the oldest inhabitants as no one applied for the cottage in which she had passed so many happy days she was permitted to remain in it where she lived solitary and almost helpless the few wants of nature were chiefly supplied from the scanty productions of her little garden which the neighbors would now and then cultivate for her it was but a few days before the time at which these circumstances were told me that she was gathering some vegetables for her repast when she heard the cottage door which faced the garden suddenly opened a stranger came out and seemed to be looking eagerly and wildly around he was dressed in seaman's clothes was emaciated and ghastly pale and bore the air of one broken by sickness and hardships he saw her and hastened towards her but his steps were faint and faltering he sank on his knees before her and sobbed like a child the poor woman gazed upon him with a vacant and wandering eye oh my dear dear mother don't you know your son your poor boy george it was indeed the wreck of her once noble lad who shattered by wounds by sickness and foreign imprisonment had at length dragged his wasted limbs homeward to repose among the scenes of his childhood i will not attempt to detail the particulars of such a meeting where sorrow and joy were so completely blended still he was alive 
he was come home. He might yet live to comfort and cherish her old age. Nature, however, was exhausted in him, and if anything had been wanting to finish the work of fate, the desolation of his native cottage would have been sufficient. He stretched himself on the pallet, on which his widowed mother had passed many a sleepless night, and he never rose from it again. The villagers, when they heard that George Somers had returned, crowded to see him, offering every comfort and assistance that their humble means afforded. He was too weak, however, to talk. He could only look his thanks. His mother was his constant attendant, and he seemed unwilling to be helped by any other hand. There is something in sickness that breaks down the pride of manhood, that softens the heart, and brings it back to the feelings of infancy. Who that has languished, even in advanced life, in sickness and despondency, who that has pined on a weary bed in the neglect and loneliness of a foreign land, but has thought on the mother, that looked on his childhood, that smoothed his pillow, and administered to his helplessness. Oh, there is an enduring tenderness in the love of a mother to a son, that transcends all other affections of the heart. It is neither to be chilled by selfishness, nor daunted by danger, nor weakened by worthlessness, nor stifled by ingratitude. She will sacrifice every comfort to his convenience. She will surrender every pleasure to his enjoyment. She will glory in his fame and exult in his prosperity. And, if misfortune overtake him, he will be the dearer to her for misfortune. And if disgrace settle upon his name, she will still love and cherish him in spite of his disgrace and if all the world beside cast him off she will be all the world to him poor george somers had known what it was to be in sickness and none to soothe lonely and in prison and none to visit him he could not endure his mother from his sight if she moved away his eye would follow her she would sit for hours by his bed, watching him as he slept. Sometimes he would start from a feverish dream, and look anxiously up until he saw her bending over him, when he would take her hand, lay it on his bosom, and fall asleep with the tranquility of a child. In this way he died. My first impulse on hearing this humble tale of affliction was to visit the cottage of the mourner, and administer pecuniary assistance, and, if possible, comfort. I found, however, on inquiry, the good feelings of the villagers had prompted them to do everything that the case admitted, and as the poor know best how to console each other's sorrows, I did not venture to intrude. The next Sunday I was at the village church, when, to my surprise, I saw the poor old woman tottering down the aisle to her accustomed seat on the steps of the altar. She had made an effort to put on something like mourning for her son, and nothing could be more touching than this struggle between pious affection and utter poverty. A black ribbon or so, a faded black handkerchief, and one or two more such humble attempts to express by outward signs the grief which passes show. When I looked round upon the storied monuments, the stately hatchments, the cold marble pomp with which grandeur mourned magnificently over departed pride, and turned to this poor widow, bowed down by age and sorrow, at the altar of her God, and offering up the prayers and praises of a pious, though a broken heart, I felt that this living monument of real grief was worth them all. I related her story to some of the wealthy members of the congregation, and they were moved by it. They exerted themselves to render her situation more comfortable, and to lighten her afflictions. It was, however, but smoothing a few steps to the grave. In the course of a Sunday or two after, 
she was missed from her usual seat at church and before i left the neighborhood i heard with a feeling of satisfaction that she had quietly breathed her last and had gone to rejoin those she loved in that world where sorrow is never known and friends are never parted end of chapter four recording by greg giordano newport ritchie florida chapter five of more selected classics of washington irving by washington irving this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by greg giordano chapter five the pride of the village may no wolf howl no screech owl stir a wing about thy sepulchre no boisterous winds or storms come hither to starve or wither thy soft sweet earth but like a spring love kept it ever flourishing herrick in the course of an excursion through one of the remote counties of england i had struck into one of those crossroads that lead through the more secluded parts of the country and stopped one afternoon at a village the situation of which was beautifully rural and retired there was an air of primitive simplicity about its inhabitants not to be found in the villages which lie on the great coach roads i determined to pass the night there and having taken an early dinner strolled out to enjoy the neighboring scenery my ramble as is usually the case with travellers soon led me to the church which stood at a little distance from the village indeed it was an object of some curiosity its old tower being completely overrun with ivy so that only here and there a jutting buttress an angle of gray wall or a fantastically carved ornament peered through the verdant covering it was a lovely evening the early part of the day had been dark and showery but in the afternoon it had cleared up and though sullen clouds still hung overhead yet there was a broad tract of golden sky in the west from which the setting sun gleamed through the dripping leaves and lit up all nature into a melancholy smile it seemed like the parting hour of a good christian smiling on the sins and sorrows of the world and giving in the serenity of his decline an assurance that he will rise again in glory i had seated myself on a half-sunken tombstone and was musing as one is apt to do at this sober thoughted hour on past scenes and early friends on those who were distant and those who were dead and indulging in that kind of melancholy fancying which has in it something sweeter even than pleasure every now and then the stroke of a bell from the neighboring tower fell on my ear its tones were in unison with the scene and instead of jarring chimed in with my feelings and it was some time before i recollected that it must be tolling the knell of some new tenant of the tomb presently i saw a funeral train moving across the village green it wound slowly along a lane was lost and reappeared through the breaks of the hedges until it passed the place where i was sitting the pall was supported by young girls dressed in white and another about the age of seventeen walked before bearing a chaplet of white flowers a token that the deceased was a young and unmarried female the corpse was followed by the parents they were a venerable couple of the better order of peasantry the father seemed to repress his feelings but his fixed eye contracted brow and deeply furrowed face showed the struggle that was passing within his wife hung on his arm and wept aloud with the convulsive bursts of a mother's sorrow i followed the funeral into the church the bier was placed in the centre aisle and the chaplet of white flowers with a pair of white gloves 
was hung over the seat which the deceased had occupied. Everyone knows the soul-subduing pathos of the funeral service, for who is so fortunate as never to have followed someone he has loved to the tomb? But when performed over the remains of innocence and beauty, thus laid low in the bloom of existence, what can be more affecting? At that simple but most solemn consignment of the body to the grave, earth to earth, ashes to ashes, dust to dust, the tears of the youthful companions of the deceased flowed unrestrained. The father still seemed to struggle with his feelings, and to comfort himself with the assurance that the dead are blessed which die in the Lord. But the mother only thought of her child as a flower of the field, cut down and withered in the midst of its sweetness. She was like Rachel, quote, mourning over her children, and would not be comforted. End quote. On returning to the inn, I learnt the whole story of the deceased. It was a simple one, and such as has often been told. She had been the beauty and pride of the village. Her father had once been an opulent farmer, but was reduced in circumstances. This was an only child, and brought up entirely at home in the simplicity of rural life. She had been the pupil of the village pastor, the favorite lamb of his little flock. The good man watched over her education with paternal care. It was limited and suitable to the sphere in which she was to move, for he only sought to make her an ornament to her station in life, not to raise her above it. The tenderness and indulgence of her parents, and the exemption from all ordinary occupations, had fostered a natural grace and delicacy of character that accorded with the fragile loveliness of her form. She appeared like some tender plant of the garden, blooming accidentally amid the harder natives of the fields. The superiority of her charms was felt and acknowledged by her companions, but without envy, for it was surpassed by the unassuming gentleness and winning kindness of her manners. It might truly be said of her, quote, This is the prettiest, low-born lass that ever ran on the green sword nothing she does or seems but smacks of something greater than herself too noble for this place End quote. the village was one of those sequestered spots which still retained some vestiges of old english customs it had its rural festivals and holiday pastimes and still kept up some faint observance of the once popular rites of may these indeed had been promoted by its present pastor who was a lover of old customs, and one of those simple Christians that think their mission fulfilled by promoting joy on earth and good will among mankind. Under his auspices, the maypole stood from year to year in the center of the village green. On May Day, it was decorated with garlands and streamers, and a queen or lady of the May was appointed, as in former times to preside at the sports and distribute the prizes and rewards. The picturesque situation of the village, and the fancifulness of its rustic fetes, would often attract the notice of casual visitors. Among these, on one May day, was a young officer whose regiment had been recently quartered in the neighborhood. He was charmed with the native taste that pervaded this village pageant, but, above all, with the dawning loveliness of the Queen of May. It was the village favorite who was crowned with flowers, and blushing and smiling in all the beautiful confusion of girlish diffidence and delight. The artlessness of rural habits enabled him readily to make her acquaintance. He gradually won his way into her intimacy, and paid his court to her in that unthinking way in which young officers are too apt to trifle with rustic simplicity. There was nothing in his advances to startle or alarm. He never even talked of love, but there are modes of making it more eloquent than language, and which convey it subtly and irresistibly to the heart. The beam of the eye, the tone of voice, the thousand tendernesses which emanate from every word and look and action, these form the true eloquence of love, and can always be felt and understood but never described. Can we wonder 
that they should readily win a heart young guileless and susceptible as to her she loved almost unconsciously she scarcely inquired what was the growing passion that was absorbing every thought and feeling or what were to be its consequences she indeed looked not to the future when present his looks and words occupied her whole attention when absent she thought but of what had passed at their recent interview she would wander with him through the green lanes and rural scenes of the vicinity he taught her to see new beauties in nature he talked in the language of polite and cultivated life and breathed into her ear the witcheries of romance and poetry perhaps there could not have been a passion between the sexes more pure than this innocent girl's the gallant figure of her youthful admirer and the splendour of his military attire might at first have charmed her eye but it was not these that had captivated her heart her attachment had something in it of idolatry she looked up to him as to a being of a superior order she felt in his society the enthusiasm of a mind naturally delicate and poetical and now first awakened to a keen perception of the beautiful and grand of the sordid distinctions of rank and fortune she thought nothing it was the difference of intellect of demeanour of manners from those of the rustic society to which she had been accustomed that elevated him in her opinion she would listen to him with charmed ear and downcast look of mute delight and her cheek would mantle with enthusiasm or if ever she ventured a shy glance of timid admiration it was as quickly withdrawn and she would sigh and blush at the idea of her comparative unworthiness her lover was equally impassioned but his passion was mingled with feelings of a coarser nature he had begun the connection in levity for he had often heard his brother officers boast of their village conquests and thought some triumph of the kind necessary to his reputation as a man of spirit but he was too full of youthful fervour his heart had not yet been rendered sufficiently cold and selfish by a wandering and a dissipated life it caught fire from the very flame it sought to kindle and before he was aware of the nature of his situation he became really in love what was he to do there were the old obstacles which so incessantly occur in these heedless attachments his rank in life the prejudices of titled connections his dependence upon a proud and unyielding father all forbade him to think of matrimony but when he looked down upon this innocent being so tender and confiding there was a purity in her manners a blamelessness in her life and a beseeching modesty in her looks that awed down every licentious feeling in vain did he try to fortify himself by a thousand heartless examples of men of fashion and to chill the glow of generous sentiment with that cold derisive levity with which he had heard them talk of female virtue whenever he came into her presence she was still surrounded by that mysterious but impassive charm of virgin purity in whose hallowed sphere no guilty thought can live the sudden arrival of orders for the regiment to repair to the continent completed the confusion of his mind he remained for a short time in a state of the most painful irresolution he hesitated to communicate the tidings until the day for marching was at hand when he gave her the intelligence in the course of an evening ramble the idea of parting had never occurred to her it broke in at once upon her dream of felicity she looked upon it as a sudden an insurmountable evil and wept with the guileless simplicity of a child he drew her to his bosom and kissed the tears from her soft cheek nor did he meet with a repulse for there are moments of mingled sorrow and tenderness which hallow the caresses of affection he was naturally impetuous and the sight of beauty apparently yielding in his arms the confidence of his power over her and the dread of losing her for ever all conspired to overwhelm his better feelings he ventured to propose that she should leave her home and be the companion of his fortunes he was quite a novice in seduction and blushed and faltered at his own baseness but so innocent of mind was his intended victim that she was at first at a loss to comprehend his meaning and why she should leave her native village and the humble roof of her parents 
when at last the nature of his proposal flashed upon her pure mind the effect was withering she did not weep she did not break forth into reproach she said not a word but she shrank back aghast as from a viper gave him a look of anguish that pierced to his very soul and clasping her hands in agony fled as if for refuge to her father's cottage the officer retired confounded humiliated and repentant it is uncertain what might have been the result of the conflict of his feelings had not his thoughts been diverted by the bustle of departure new scenes new pleasures and new companions soon dissipated his self-reproach and stifled his tenderness yet amidst the stir of camps the revelries of garrisons the array of armies and even the din of battles his thoughts would sometimes steal back to the scenes of rural quiet and village simplicity the white cottage the footpath along the silver brook and up the hawthorn hedge and the little village maid loitering along it leaning on his arm and listening to him with eyes beaming with unconscious affection the shock which the poor girl had received in the destruction of all her ideal world had indeed been cruel faintings and hysterics had at first shaken her tender frame and were succeeded by a settled and pining melancholy she had beheld from her window the march of the departing troops she had seen her faithless lover borne off as if in triumph amidst the sound of drum and trumpet and the pomp of arms she strained a last aching gaze after him as the morning sun glittered about his figure and his plume waved in the breeze he passed away like a bright vision from her sight and left her all in darkness it would be tried to dwell on the particulars of her after story it was like other tales of love melancholy she avoided society and wandered out alone in the walks she had most frequented with her lover she sought like the stricken deer to weep in silence and loneliness and brood over the barbed sorrow that rankled in her soul sometimes she would be seen late of an evening sitting in the porch of the village church and the milkmaids returning from the fields would now and then overhear her singing some plaintive ditty on the hawthorn walk she became fervent in her devotions at church and as the old people saw her approach so wasted away yet with a hectic gloom and that hallowed air which melancholy diffuses round the form they would make way for her as for something spiritual and looking after her would shake their heads in gloomy foreboding she felt a conviction that she was hastening to the tomb but looked forward to it as a place of rest the silver cord that had bound her to existence was loosed and there seemed to be no more pleasure under the sun if ever her gentle bosom had entertained resentment against her lover it was extinguished she was incapable of angry passions and in a moment of saddened tenderness she penned him a farewell letter it was couched in the simplest language but touching from its very simplicity she told him that she was dying and did not conceal from him that his conduct was the cause she even depicted the sufferings which she had experienced but concluded with saying that she could not die in peace until she had sent him her forgiveness and her blessing by degrees her strength declined that she could no longer leave the cottage she could only totter to the window where propped up in her chair it was her enjoyment to sit all day and look out upon the landscape still she uttered no complaint nor imparted to any one the malady that was preying on her heart she never even mentioned her lover's name but would lay her head on her mother's bosom and weep in silence her poor parents hung in mute anxiety over this fading blossom of their hopes still flattering themselves that it might again revive to freshness and that the bright unearthly bloom which sometimes flushed her cheek might be the promise of returning health in this way she was seated between them one sunday afternoon her hands were clasped in theirs the lattice was thrown open and the soft air that stole in brought with it the fragrance of the clustering honeysuckle which her own hands had trained around the window her father had just been reading a chapter in the bible it spoke of the vanity of worldly things and of the joys of heaven it seemed to have diffused comfort and serenity through her bosom 
her eye was fixed on the distant village church the bell had tolled for the evening service the last villager was lagging into the porch and everything had sunk into that hallowed stillness peculiar to the day of rest her parents were gazing on her with yearning hearts sickness and sorrow which passed so roughly over some faces had given to hers the expression of a seraph's a tear trembled in her soft blue eye was she thinking of her faithless lover or were her thoughts wandering to that distant churchyard into whose bosom she might soon be gathered suddenly the clang of hoofs was heard a horseman galloping to the cottage he dismounted before the window poor girl gave a faint exclamation and sunk back in her chair it was her repentant lover he rushed into the house and flew to clasp her to his bosom but her wasted form her death-like countenance so wan yet so lovely in its desolation smote him to the soul and he threw himself in agony at her feet she was too faint to rise she attempted to extend her trembling hand her lips moved as if she spoke but no word was articulated she looked down upon him with a smile of unutterable tenderness and closed her eyes for ever such are the particulars which i gathered of this village story they are but scanty and i am conscious of little novelty to recommend them in the present rage also for a strange incident and high season narrative they may appear trite and insignificant but they interested me strongly at the time and taken in connection with the affecting ceremony which i had just witnessed left a deeper impression on my mind than many circumstances of a more striking nature i have passed through the place since and visited the church again from a better motive than mere curiosity it was a wintry evening the trees were stripped of their foliage the churchyard looked naked and mournful and the wind rustled coldly through the dry grass evergreens however had been planted about the grave of the village favourite and osiers were bent over it to keep the turf uninjured the church door was open and i stepped in there hung the chaplet of flowers and the gloves as on the day of the funeral the flowers were withered it is true but care seemed to have been taken that no dust should soil their whiteness i have seen many monuments where art has exhausted its powers to awaken the sympathy of the spectator but i have met with none that spoke more touchingly to my heart than this simple but delicate memento of departed innocence End of chapter five recording by greg giordano newport ritchie florida chapter six of more selected classics of washington irving by washington irving this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by greg giordano chapter six the broken heart i never heard of any true affection but twas nipped with care that like the caterpillar eats the leaves of the spring's sweetest book the rose middleton it is a common practice with those who have outlived the susceptibility of early feeling or have been brought up in the gay heartlessness of dissipated life to laugh at all love stories and to treat the tales of romantic passion as mere fictions of novelists and poets my observations on human nature have induced me to think otherwise they have convinced me that however the surface of the character may be chilled and frozen by the cares of the world or cultivated into mere smiles by the arts of society still there are dormant fires lurking in the depths of the coldest bosom which when once enkindled become impetuous and are sometimes desolating in their effects indeed i am a true believer in the blind deity and go to the full extent of his doctrines shall i confess it i believe in broken hearts and the possibility of dying of disappointed love i do not however consider it a malady often fatal to my own sex 
but I firmly believe that it withers down many a lovely woman into an early grave. Man is the creature of interest and ambition. His nature leads him forth into the struggle and bustle of the world. Love is but the embellishment of his early life, or a song piped in the intervals of the acts. He seeks for fame, for fortune, for space in the world's thought, and dominion over his fellow men. But a woman's whole life is a history of the affections. The heart is her world. It is there her ambition strives for empire. It is there her avarice seeks for hidden treasures. She sends forth her sympathies on adventure. She embarks her whole soul in the traffic of affection. And if shipwrecked, her case is hopeless, for it is a bankruptcy of the heart. To a man, the disappointment of love may occasion some bitter pangs. It wounds some feelings of tenderness. It blasts some prospects of felicity. But he is an active being. He may dissipate his thoughts in the whirl of varied occupation, or may plunge into the tide of pleasure, or, if the scene of disappointment be too full of painful associations, he can shift his abode at will, and taking, as it were, the wings of the morning, can, quote, fly to the uttermost parts of the earth, and be at rest. End quote. But woman's is comparatively a fixed and secluded and meditative life. She is more the companion of her own thoughts and feelings, and if they are turned to ministers of sorrow, where shall she look for consolation? Her lot is to be wooed and won, and if unhappy in her love, her heart is like some fortress that has been captured and sacked and abandoned and left desolate. How many bright eyes grow dim, how many soft cheeks grow pale, how many lovely forms fade away into the tomb, and none can tell the cause that blighted their loveliness. As the dove will clasp its wings to its side, and cover and conceal the arrow that is preying on its vitals, so is it the nature of woman to hide from the world the pangs of wounded affection. The love of a delicate female is always shy and silent. Even when fortunate, she scarcely breathes it to herself. But when otherwise, she buries it in the recesses of her bosom, and there lets it cower and brood among the ruins of her peace. With her, the desire of her heart has failed. The great charm of existence is at an end. She neglects all the cheerful exercises which gladden the spirits, quicken the pulses, and send the tide of life and healthful current through the veins. Her rest is broken, the sweet refreshment of sleep is poisoned by melancholy dreams. Dry sorrow drinks her blood, until her enfeebled frame sinks under the slightest external injury. Look for her, after a little while, and you find friendship weeping over her untimely grave, and wondering that one, who but lately glowed with all the radiance of health and beauty, should so speedily be brought down to darkness and the worm. You will be told of some wintry chill, some casual indisposition that laid her low. But no one knows of the mental malady which previously sapped her strength and made her so easy a prey to the spoiler. She is like some tender tree, the pride and beauty of the grove, graceful in its form, bright in its foliage, but with the worm preying at its heart. We find it suddenly withering, when it should be most fresh and luxuriant. We see it drooping its branches to the earth, and shedding leaf by leaf, until, wasted and perished away, it falls even in the stillness of the forest. And as we muse over the beautiful ruin, we strive in vain to recollect the blast or thunderbolt that could have smitten it with decay. I have seen many instances of woman running to waste and self-neglect, and disappearing gradually from the earth, almost as if they had been exhaled to heaven, and have repeatedly fancied that I could trace their deaths through the various declensions of consumption, cold, debility, languor, melancholy, until I reached the first symptom of disappointed love. But an instance of the kind was lately told to me, 
the circumstances are well known in the country where they have happened and i shall but give them in the manner in which they were related every one must recollect the tragical story of young e the irish patriot it was too touching to be soon forgotten during the troubles in ireland he was tried condemned and executed on a charge of treason his fate made a deep impression on public sympathy he was so young so intelligent so generous so brave so everything that we are apt to like in a young man his conduct under trial too was so lofty and intrepid the noble indignation with which he repelled the charge of treason against his country the eloquent vindication of his name and his pathetic appeal to posterity in the hopeless hour of condemnation all these entered deeply into every generous bosom and even his enemies lamented the stern policy that dictated his execution but there was one heart whose anguish it would be impossible to describe in happier days and fairer fortunes he had won the affections of a beautiful and interesting girl the daughter of a late celebrated irish barrister she loved him with the disinterested fervour of a woman's first and early love when every worldly maxim arrayed itself against him when blasted in fortune and disgrace and danger darkened around his name she loved him the more ardently for his very sufferings if then his fate could awaken the sympathy even of his foes what must have been the agony of her whose whole soul was occupied by his image let those tell who have had the portals of the tomb suddenly closed between them and the being they most loved on earth who have sat at its threshold as one shut out in a cold and lonely world whence all that was most lovely and loving had departed but in the horrors of such a grave so frightful so dishonoured there is nothing for memory to dwell on that could soothe the pang of separation none of those tender though melancholy circumstances which endear the parting scene nothing to melt sorrow into those blessed tears sent like the dews of heaven to revive the heart in the parting hour of anguish to render her widowed situation more desolate she had incurred her father's displeasure by her unfortunate attachment and was in exile from the paternal roof but could the sympathy and kind offices of friends have reached a spirit so shocked and driven in by horror she would have experienced no want of consolation for the irish are a people of quick and generous sensibilities the most delicate and cherishing attentions were paid her by families of wealth and distinction she was led into society and they tried by all kinds of occupation and amusement to dissipate her grief and wean her from the tragical story of her loves but it was all in vain there are some strokes of calamity that scathe and scorch the soul which penetrate to the vital seat of happiness and blast it never again to put forth bud or blossom she never objected to frequent the haunts of pleasure but was as much alone there as in the depths of solitude walking about in a sad reverie apparently unconscious of the world around her she carried with her an inward woe that mocked at all the blandishments of friendship and quote, he did not the song of the charmer charm he never so wisely End quote. the person who told me her story had seen her in a masquerade there can be no exhibition of far-gone wretchedness more striking and painful than to meet it in such a scene to find it wandering like a spectre lonely and joyless where all around is gay to see it dressed out in the trappings of mirth looking so wan and woebegone as if it had tried in vain to cheat the poor heart into momentary forgetfulness of sorrow after strolling through the splendid rooms and giddy crowd with an air of utter abstraction she sat herself down on the steps of a orchestra and looked about for some time with a vacant air that showed her insensibility to the garish scene she began with the capriciousness of a sickly heart to warble a little plaintive air she had an exquisite voice but on this occasion it was so simple so touching it breathed forth such a soul of wretchedness that she drew a crowd 
mute and silent around her and melted every one unto tears the story of one so true and tender could not but excite great interest in a country remarkable for enthusiasm it completely won the heart of a brave officer who paid his addresses to her and thought that one so true to the dead could not but prove affectionate to the living she declined his attentions for her thoughts were irrevocably engrossed by the memory of her former lover he however persisted in his suit he solicited not her tenderness but her esteem he was assisted by her conviction of his worth and her sense of her own destitute and dependent situation for she was existing on the kindness of friends in a word he at length succeeded in gaining her hand though with the solemn assurance that her heart was unalterably another's he took her with him to sicily hoping that a change of scene might wear out the remembrance of early woes she was an amiable and exemplary wife and made an effort to be a happy one but nothing could cure the silent and devouring melancholy that had entered into her very soul she wasted away in a slow but hopeless decline and at length sunk into the grave the victim of a broken heart it was on her that moore the distinguished irish poet composed the following lines she is far from the land where her young hero sleeps and lovers around her are sighing but coldly she turns from their gaze and weeps for her heart in his grave is lying she sings the wild songs of her dear native plains every note which he loved awaking ah little they think who delight in her strains how the heart of the minstrel is breaking he had lived for his love for his country he died they were all that to life had entwined him nor soon shall the tears of his country he dried nor long will his love stay behind him oh make her a grave where the sunbeams rest when they promise a glorious morrow they'll shine o'er her sleep like a smile from the west from her own loved island of sorrow end of chapter six recording by greg giordano newport ritchie florida end of more selected classics of washington irving by washington irving